All right, so now in this video, we will be talking about what is free float or free Slack. Uh, again, Slack and float are exactly the same thing. Just some people say float, some people say Slack. I generally use the word float when I'm talking about this. But we're talking about what is free float and how are we going to calculate it in a network diagram. Well, first of all, free float or free Slack, as some people say, is the amount of time you can delay an activity without delaying the earliest start of any succeeding activities. So first off, let's draw the PDM network diagram for this table of dependencies, and you already know how to do that. It looks like this. So then we can go ahead and do the forward pass to calculate the early start and the early finish. And then we can do the backward pass to calculate the late finish and late start. And you know from the last video how to calculate the total float for each activity. And by identifying which activities have a total float of zero, we can draw on our critical path. Now we want to figure out the free float for each activity in our network diagram. And again, free float, or free slack, is the amount of time you can delay any activity without delaying the earliest starts of any succeeding activities. Notice that doesn't mention anything about the final end date of the project or the duration of the project. It only refers to this, the earliest start of any succeeding activity. It's an important difference. So the formula for it is as follows. Where free float is the minimum early start of all of the successors. For example, activity A has two successors. It's B and C. So we have the minimum early start of those minus the early start of the activity that we're looking at minus the duration of the activity that we're looking at. So we'll be writing free float below each node. So let's go ahead and calculate the free floats. So the free float for activity A is the minimum early start of all of the successors. So in this case we have 5 and the other option is 5. So we have to pick 5. Now we subtract the early start of the activity that we're looking at. So we'll subtract 0 and then we'll subtract the duration of the activity we're looking at. So minus 5. So we have 5 minus 0, minus 5, so we get a free float of 0. Something else to mention is that free float always has to be less than or equal to total float. So right away, if you already know the critical path because you've identified all of the activities that have a total float of 0, you could just go in and fill out all of the free floats to be 0 as well, or we can just double check. So let's look at activity B. Its only successor is activity D, so we'll have the, the early start of D minus the early start of B, minus the duration of B, so we have uh, 9 minus 5 minus 4 is 0. So we'll get a free float of 0. Same thing for activity D. The earliest start of, the minimum early start of any of its successors is 15 because it only has one successor, so 15 minus 9 minus 6, free float is equal to 0. And same for the last, well, activity F doesn't have any successors, but you can see here that total float is zero, and the free float can't be greater than that, so free float also has to be zero. Let's look at these guys. Free float for activity C, we would have 10 minus 5 minus 5, so we get a zero here. Free float for activity E, we are going to use 15 minus 10 minus 3, so we will get a free float of 2. So why does this one have a free float of 2 and this one have a free float of 0 when they both have a total float of 2? Well, total float, if you recall, was the amount of time we can delay one of these activities without increasing the length of the project or delaying the end date of the project. So let's take either of these. Let's look at activity E. If we delayed it by two days, we would actually get its late start. We would start on day 12. We would finish on day 15, and when we bring this 15 in uh, into activity F, it's not going to increase the start of activity F, the earliest start of activity F, because it was already had to start on 15 anyways because of activity D. So that activity F would end on 19, and then the whole project would still end on the 19th day, even if we delayed activity E by two days. Same thing would happen if we delayed activity C by two days. We would actually end up starting on the seventh day, we'd finish on 12, we'd bring that 12 over, then activity E would be from 12 to 15, and then again, when we bring that 15 up here, we're not pushing back the start date of activity F, and therefore we're not pushing back the end of the entire project. But free float has nothing to do with the end date of the project. Free float is the amount of time you can delay an activity without delaying the earliest start of any succeeding activity. 
So let's look at activity E again. With that definition, if we delay activity E by two days, we would start on the 12th, we would end on the 15th, and then we're not affecting the early start of activity F. So that's why it's free float is two, because we can, we can delay it by up to two days before we would start affecting the, the early start of any of its succeeding activities. And in this case, it only has one succeeding activity. But let's look at activity C now. If we delayed activity C by any amount of time, even if we delayed it by one day, say we delayed it by one day, we would start on the 6, we would end on 11, and then if we brought an 11 over to activity E, well, its early start is 10. So if we were delaying the early start by, for example, starting on the 11th day, then the early start of E has been affected. This wouldn't affect the early start of F, but we have affected the early start of any of the preceding, or sorry, succeeding activities. So in that sense, there's no amount of time that we can delay activity C by without affecting some of the succeeding activities early starts. So that's what free float is. Is it useful? Mm, questionable. Um, but will it be asked from you, from your teacher on a test? Probably. So that's how you calculate it.